So thank you everybody for coming. I'm going to say a couple of words. I'm going to introduce the panelists. I should say up front, one of our panelists is still in transit in New York City traffic. She's coming from LA. So we're going to just get started and fold her in as soon as she gets here. So bear with us. Um, last year, we were all stopped in our tracks by, by a global pandemic without any real precedent. Against a backdrop of isolation and separation of a COVID-induced lo lockdown, the world was then rocked by the horrific and violent murder of George Floyd, which gave increased velocity and urgency to the Black Lives Matter campaign. All in all, Black Lives Matter is now the biggest movement in the history of this country. We're now living in a world with no map and no blueprint. What does this mean for commerce and culture? and more particularly for fashion and jewelry. What is the new normal? Who are the new establishment? Helping us explore these questions today are four visionary thinkers who I'd like, now like to invite to the stage. Pat Danby beca began her career in Botswana with the De Beers Group as one of the first black female management trainees. She's since had an impressive series of leadership roles in Southern Africa including executive director of media broadcasting for Phoebe Investment Corporation, which was the first black-owned investment company in the country and was established under the auspices of Nelson Mandela. She's also led transformational work in advertising at Foot Cone and Belding and served as the VP of Corporate Affairs for Coca-Cola in South Africa. Since 2014, Pat has been back at De Beers in a variety of executive roles, most recently as VP for Market Outreach. Jamil Mohammed founded his Afrofuturist brand, Kiri, in 2016. It means wealth and fortune in Swahili. Jamil was, just three years ago, coming to New York from his hometown in Chicago when he received a request from Michelle Obama's stylist to loan pieces for her book tour. That was just the start. More recently, Jamil was a 2021 CFDA Vogue fi fashion finalist, and his designs have been worn by a myriad of incredible celebrities. The panel today will be facilitated and moderated by award-winning writer, stylist, and editor, Tanya Jukes. Tanya is recognized as a leading expert and writer in the fine jewelry category, and she was named the first ever style editor of Elite Traveler. Tanya's nuanced writing and discerning eye can be seen in many places. She's a frequent con contributor to the New York Times, El Decor, The Rob Report, and many, many others. Please welcome our panel, and we'll get started, and we'll add in Zarina as soon as she comes. Just robe now. On. Can you hear me? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks for the amazing introduction. I'm so thrilled that you all are here and that we can be here together this year in person. Um, so I'm going to jump right in because we are going to have a mini master class, I feel like, from the new establishment. Um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> um, uh, so I guess. You know, the first thing I want to just ask you is, how do you feel about the the concept of establishment? Like, do you, when you hear that you're self mentioned in those terms, is it something that you feel good about? Do you, do you feel like establishment is an outmoded concept? What's your what's your beat on that? Ooh, <laughs> uh, we are jumping in. Um, okay, so <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, it's it's still very clear to me as an entrepreneur that like I'm contending with an establishment that's like far more entrenched than like the few black people in this industry who are like very readily visible, you know. Um it's there's a lot of other factors that go beyond like having an, a real institutional um sort of status within an industry than like sort of um, even just like the regard of people, right? There's like capital, there is like network, there is so many other steps, you know, 
And so it's like still very clear to me that I'm like playing in a game that like is not defined by people like me, you know? And at the same time, you know, it's also emergingly clear that like people really do kind of look to me, you know, as like a source of inspiration, you know, and um, are really happy to see me progress. And so like balancing those two kinds of parts of this reality is, is definitely like uh, interesting. <laughs> I, I think for me it's um, the word establishment is new and it means something that is going to stay um, which we haven't heard before and the idea of uh, a new establishment means new thinking new approaches and new opportunities which also means new challenges uh, for people like you Jamil <laughs> But I think it's something to embrace because it does mean that um, the industry recognizes change, whatever that change may be, but there's an understanding that things have to change and need to be different from what they were. So I actually like the word because it's never existed before. There were other terms that were used for inclusion and diversity. And now, being part of the establishment, not on the side, but being part of the influence is, is a very good thing. It's a, it's a paradigm shift. Um, so since we, you, you kind of like that feeling of, of the establishment, what are some of the things that you want to bring to the table in, in your respective roles as, as shifting, as creating this paradigm shift? What are some of the things that are on your radar? Um, yeah, I think that it's like, it's multifaceted. Um, ownership is really important to me. Um, and thinking about who else is in the value chain is important to me. Um, I think representation is like important to me. And that was kind of like the um, initial founding premise of the brand was to like contend in what I saw as like sort of an image war, you know, that like, you can leverage kind of the authority and the cultural authority of like luxury and fashion to tell stories about black culture in a way that are, um, that's like kind of uncompromisingly like opulent and also uncompromisingly uncom black and interested in kind of not just the aesthetics of blackness, but also the experience of it, you know? Um, and so that's, that's a few things that I try to bring to the fore in my work is like, um, how can we really leverage the access that I have as a designer to tell, you know, a new story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to your point, Jamil, is being a partner. You know, before I think there was, um, it was a quota opportunity. Now you're coming in with the creativity that can influence the thinking, can influence the, the approaches. Um, influence the materials that are used and where they're coming from and how important that is. So I think that um, that change in the, in the whole idea of establishment means partnership and collaboration to your, to your point. Um, and what does that mean? It means that there needs to be some reviewed definitions and approaches. Uh, Jamil talked about the value chain. What does that mean to the new establishment because the new establishment is very new in that area. You know, from the business element to the creativity, to the marketing, to the liquidity and all the things that are required so, to be a partner. Yeah. So I think that's one of the things that you're mentioning in terms of that whole value chain. Yeah. Very important to the whole process. Yeah. And I, I think that that's one of the things also to your earlier question of like, what does it feel like to have that term applied? Is there are so many more things that I want to contend with you know, in my practice. Like I would love to be producing the majority of my work in like black majority communities, you know, whether that's here or in the continent or somewhere else. Um, and that is like a much, that feels like such a significant lift from like even where I am now, you know, and so that's kind of how I mark like where I am along the journey of like really feeling comfortable 
like saying like, yes, I'm established. It's like, how much do I feel like my values can totally guide all of my actions and thus can like sort of really um, influence like the, the wider world beyond me, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I want to, we've already touched on a lot of things. I want to, one thing that I'm curious about, especially because just recently, you know, I mean, you were nominated for the CFDA Vogue Award. <laughs> Applause break. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering what kind of, um, what role do kind of existing frameworks like that play in terms of getting you closer to those goals of, of producing the way you want to and, and, and so forth? And also, I mean, this year I just have to see that there were so many, I mean, I've never seen so many people of color nominated, represented, whether it's Zendaya, Aurora James, Telfar, all these people. I was like, out of the woodwork. <laughs> so also, what was it like to kind of be in that space with so many different kind of creators of color? Yeah, I mean, well, to answer that question, first and foremost, like that was an incredible experience. And you, I, I expected to be in that position someday, you know, but to have it be this early in my career and to be surrounded by people whose work I really respected, you know, was, was amazing to me. Um, to, yeah, do you just want to take up a second? <laughs> <laughs> Serena's here, y'all. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah, it's actually here for the... Did you just read this? <laughs> <laughs> Did you read this? Okay, Hi, Serena. Pleasure. How are you? Yay. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Does this work? Is it on? I think so. I think so. I think so. It's moderate. All right. All right. Well... I'm going to give you a quick intro. I have your bio here. I want to share with the people. And then we're going to resume, because I think we got you mid-question. Mid yes. Um, the, the lovely Zarina Akers has joined us, y'all. Um, she has become a fashion household name for being the architect behind celebrity signature looks as stylist and her work as costume designer. Her past contributions have been recognized and awarded by the Emmys for Disney's Black is King. Her e-commerce marketplace, Black Owned Everything, seeks to incubate, amplify, and empower a community of brands to stimulate diverse audiences to shop inclusively. I hope I got Thank that right. <laughs> That was good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, what? Are, what? So the question I think was, how do, how does like participating in these kinds of like pre-existing structures within the industry get me further mm -hmm. and closer toward um, like that point of real self-determination? You know, and I think that like structures have always existed to like empower people, you know, whether or not they were people who had like my exact biography, you know, <laughs> traditionally, uh, you know, they were not typically, <laughs> but I think that those sorts of programs still put together resources in a way, mm -hmm. you know, from the vantage point of people who can understand like, what are the various needs that you might have as a person in your position trying to get to where we are, you know, <laughs> we the organizers of said program. Um, and they, they have a specific vantage point on um, development, on how to sort of um, approach things step by step and like what are the core fundamentals to get out of the way, you know? And sometimes, you know, I've been resistant and been like, no, I'm gonna do it my way, you know? And then you do later find out like, oh no, there was like a little bit of wisdom <laughs> in like that 40 year opinion, you know? <laughs> uh, so yeah. yeah, that's what I would say. Okay. Yeah. Any CFDA tea? that you would like to share with us? Zero, zero. <laughs> that is Sorry. not, it was not what we're doing here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to give me trouble. You know, I'm trying to get an exclusive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and I mean, Zarina, you obviously have your own incubator and platform. How do you work with, you know, people who are kind of like in Jamil's position to kind of become a structure that helps advance their, their work and bring them to the next level? 
Um, you know, we've been fortunate enough to gain, we black on everything gained a lot of pop popularity really quickly yeah. uh, last summer. And we've, I, I've wanted to, the brand and the company to kind of become a stamp, you know, like if you come here, you know that there's, you know, you're going to find good brands, you're going to get a certain amount, a certain quality, but we've been able to partner with larger corporations like with Netflix, with Google um, on launch, with Instagram. Uh, Nordstrom, Nike, and to be able to bring some of the independent creators into the space uh, has been uh, an interesting learning situation. Like, you know, we have we brought in uh, Sammy B into the Nike Nordstrom Prime Partnership, and she actually was the, it was her first time entering into the wholesale space. And sometimes you just got to dive off the deep end, and that's kind of how she was able to learn. But it was definitely an uphill battle from there, you know. But bringing them into these these spaces and and kind of giving them this visibility, I think, has been able to, um, you know, propel so many people into into it's almost even shifting the trajectory of the of the brand or what they thought the brand could be, uh, which is which is it's really nice to watch, and it's that's probably the most rewarding part of it. But how does someone get to that place? You, you mentioned this designer who had to kind of jump in, had never done wholesale before. So what are the tools? How does one so get we, to that place? We actually, um, through the, like I'm actually trying to solve some of these same issues like and implement uh, systems in, through the Acres and Acres Foundation because I'm seeing that a lot of people just don't know where to start, don't know, don't have the infrastructure. Um, Sammy actually partnered with our product development woman, Nadia Spencer, that helped her, and she helped us even get the, the right tags, the right UPC codes, and the right bags, and you know all of those things, because she's familiar in the space. Uh, so even the goal there is to just like, I was just having this conversation yesterday to the, to the at a private meeting with the Nordstrom, um, like buyers and things like that. I'm like, okay, yeah, you guys want to buy, but like Nordstrom's notorious for being the hardest company to deal with on a wholesale level because you demand so much, you give so little, um, you know, so figuring out. So actually now kind of pitching to them, how do we develop a program that gets you there? You know what I mean? Like that teaches you sort of from point A to point B. And even if you're not going to end up in the store, it can get maybe you just get in front of the buyers. But there's so many steps to getting to that point. It's like I don't think a lot of people I think a lot of these companies are, you know, first trying to, um, you know, just say face. You know, we're going to partner with this. We're going to do this, but they're actually kind of hindering the the creator in in a lot of aspects because they they just it's such a burden, you know, um, to try and get in. And we, I mean, we you know, we're rigid. We figure it out. You know, we're resilient, so we're we're figuring it out. But I'm sure you know you've had some hardships as well in in the space. But you know, so I'm just trying to you know really partner with people to get them get the infrastructure and I think that get that base first because that's the only way to scale you know it's to get that that kind of structure in place first and to to have the knowledge and be aware of it yeah on a on a on a broader scale like how does how do you recommend or how would what if the the steps you followed for instance to to build this this knowledge this body of knowledge is it a mentor is it how are we doing this <laughs> I, I think I have like taking advantage often of just like reaching out to folks and trying to glean whatever like little bit of insight, you know? And sometimes I've often experienced that like, okay, here's a bunch of advice for someone who has like $200,000 in the bank, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> and one bit of advice that is applicable <laughs> to my situation, you know? <laughs> and so you have to, but, but, even though that might be the proportion, you know, you can't really throw away that one little kernel, you know, that can be the thing that makes you think differently about whatever the process is. Mm -hmm. And and you, I think a, another part of it is like just doing a little bit of homework. I read this book at the very beginning called The Fashion Designer's Survival Guide. That's just like marketing, press, PR, like just here's an intro to like how like all these things worked in like 2007, you know, <laughs> but still, you know, just baseline knowledge to even go into those conversations, like understanding the terms that are being used, like yeah. people will often check you like, 
do you know what an RTV is? Like, mm -hmm. that'll help, that can be the, the sort of the thing that gets you past that. And then the last thing that I would say, apart from my own like experience would be like, spend as much time developing like a direct audience as possible, you know? Like I think that even now in conversations with retailers, I recognize that like, the groundswell of industry support that I have would be like, and that amount of leverage that I have in those conversations would be like 10x if it was like a groundswell of like tweens ages 12 to you know 19 who were like, I need this from this brand, you know? <laughs> and so there is like a kind of a trade off in how you kind of approach your career. Are you looking to gain first the like kind of approval of established gatekeepers, you know, or eschew that for the time being and then sort of builds in, you know, build to the point where they have to kind of recognize you. And I don't think that it's like one or the other. It's not, it can't ever be that hard line, you know, but it is like, you got to take stock of where you're like investing your time. Yeah, it's almost, it's almost like you can't really have, you don't really have a choice if they're going to validate you or not. But when, when you're doing, when you're really just enjoying what you're doing and doing the work and moving forward and educating yourself, then the rest kind of comes. And yeah. even if it's that small loyal group or, yeah. yeah. Cause I can say that starting black owned everything. Okay. It's one thing to be a stylist, right? I could do that with my eyes closed. You know what I mean? Give me, I could put a look, I could do that with my left hand. Like, you know, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but becoming a businesswoman sent me into depression because it's not easy. Like, and then you, oh, like, I had no idea what I was doing. And I talked to, I just started calling people. Fortunately, it gained the kind of traction that people also called me. You know, what is this? I want to help you, you know, from volunteers. I have one girl that's been, been with me now. Now I hired her. She was the first person to say, I want to help with this. And we've never met in person. You know, she lives in Dallas and she's been with, she's been tried and true for a year and a half. <laughs> it, serious. And, you know, other people, I just call say, hey, I have this idea. I want to do this thing. And I talked to, so I mean, my throat was dry. Like, I mean, talked to so many people. Um, but again, those nuggets, you know, those, those site introductions, you might want to talk to this person. You might want to talk to that person. And then you kind of, we just kind of. But there's also an out. opportunity to your point I mean, you talk about the partnerships that you have. And part of the whole idea of the new establishment is say, wait a minute, you know, let's partner on incubating certain areas of my business because I can't be the end all. And together we can make magic. You know that, that's why we're having this conversation. And here are the areas, this is, like you said, you got depressed because you had to deal with the business element going, mm -hmm. give me the resources that you already have within the business so i can do why you came to me in the first place exactly you so know? we were even like the googles right through shopify we met i mean through google met the people at shopify was cool with the people at instagram mm -hmm. now shopify is rebuilding our site and building a new integration that we can beta test to make the marketplace work because our, our whatever where we were on it just didn't work right you know right. um right. and ma and kind of maximizing that but that's like a, sp a certain space and that's why we try to pull people in there's some we're so there's some <laughs> of my people in here tonight you know but it's like you try to pull in mm -hmm. you know because other than that you know you just kind of end up absolutely you know right. everybody, there's so many yeah. it's like it's just so easy i just i got off yeah. a phone call today or someone's like i shop if i I, I'm on the phone with them for two hours, and I'm yeah. like, something as simple, this is people I'm just texting me every day, you know what I mean? And it's like it's true. that right. simple access, you know, and right. giving them that access. And to your point, um, both Jamil and uh, Zarina, is that, I mean, the, the establishments sometimes don't know. I mean, we went through that as De Beers. We had to learn to listen, to have this kind of consulting approach to, well, what? what is it that you're struggling with, you know? And finding out what those real issues are because honestly speaking, sometimes you just get into, you know, you think you're enabling, yeah. mm -hmm. but you really go, geez, I didn't think about that. We need to get the diamonds. We need to get, 
you know, the value chain. We need to get the, the positioning. And those are the things that I think a lot of creatives think, I can't talk about it. Right, and you know? I, think I was going to say, and a lot of people probably don't want to seem right. like they are, you know, less than yeah. ignorant. Yeah. Not, you know what I mean? And they're right. just trying to. They're just like, okay, I'm going to just, I don't know, until they're like, until it's too late. Yes, you know, and now yes. you've missed the deadline, or now yeah. you've, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's important, it is important to have those conversations. And I, and I myself am, is, am guilty of that. I remember early on partnering with Macy's, being afraid to say, I don't know how much to charge you. Mm. You know what I mean? Backing down from the conversation yeah. and then coming back. And you what's know? the response to that? They're like, fantastic. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I guess, like, what are some of the things that really moved the needle for you? I mean, you, you're kind of still young in your career. I mean, we're all, we all have ish. <laughs> I mean, not all of us have Emmys, you but. <laughs> but, and just, like, what are some of the things? Because, know what, there's so many things you could be focusing on, whether it's building a collaboration with someone like De Beers or, you know, a million other things, learning what all the abbreviations are. So, what are the things? that someone really, that moved the needle. I mean, I know you were at one point in Barney's, but still maybe looking for a restaurant job at some point, or maybe thinking about it. That is correct. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did my research. Um, I mean, yeah, that's the other thing, right? Like, early on, if you are coming to the table without anything that people respect, or like, are aware of, like, the deal is not necessarily gonna be in your favor. I'm just gonna leave that where that is. <laughs> 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 But, or it's at least not the first one, right? Um, and I think that like over time, I've kind of recognized uh, the leverage that I have been able to accrue, you know? And it mostly has been through press, like industry validations, stuff like that. Placements in some stores, and that's, they're going great, I have good partners. But I think what um, I have learned in the past year is like how much it is my responsibility kind of to push back on the terms, you know, mm -hmm. and to like not just push back, but also educate as to why like this is not going to work for me or like another person in my position, you know? Mm -hmm. And I've noticed over maybe like the past year my own ability to kind of be like, all right, so. Now I sent that email and people are like, okay, let's let's rethink. Like, uh, let's put in an extra grant. Let's mm -hmm. le let's put in some extra programming. Let's mm -hmm. extend this deadline. Let's bar this, you know, requirement. And I feel like, you know, I hope that those are not just like wins that I'm accumulating for my own private business as like secrets, you know, like, ooh, I've I knew the secret key to get the discount from this retailer, you know. I hope and, you know, have seen in some, exist some instances, some not, like, people changing policies, you know, after the next person, you yeah. know, the next cycle of this program, the next person who was bought by that store. Um, and I think that, that that work is sometimes uncomfortable, but I think that that is also a part of, like, leveraging the access that you have to those structures to leave your impression on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you guys are the game changers, right? So much is expected from you because like you said, you're, you're gonna be writing your own book <laughs> of the, but more importantly, you're also the game changers for establishments as to what it takes. And I think from, uh, from De Beers, we learn every day from our designers um, as to what the issues are. And we take them seriously, you know. Some of them we go, okay, you know. And some of them we go, you know, there are places where we can help. Yeah. Like you said, we may not write the $200,000 check. We can figure something out. <laughs> <laughs> but that's your goal. Yeah. And say, can we be an enabler to that? To get there. And what does that take? And I also think that it's, you know, the, the conversations, and you think about how much money, you can actually validate the cost of those things and say, listen, I need you to do this, this is what I'm doing, right? Yeah. And let's look at marketing it together. And I think you're doing that right now. You are setting, 
the, the new plan, you're setting the new trend of what that new establishment is for the future. And like you said in the beginning, you said in the beginning I was doing, now look where you are now. So that's so important to document and be the spokespeople of how to do it right. It's, it's uh, very encouraging. Yeah. And I mean, you, you have all been participants in collaborations. I think, Jamil, you have actually worked with the Beers. Um, so what are some of the things that you think about when you're weighing collaborations and who you want to work with or not? What are, you want to? Um, you know, first, we kind of co-write the program, really. So we, I, I work alongside my manager, sort of slash agent, and we kind of negotiate these deals, right? But it's always about like, you know, firstly, it's like, what are your, what is your intentions? You know, and how is it, and how are the business, the businesses, you know, really benefiting from this partnership? It's not just putting them, okay, put them in the forefront, but okay, what are they learning? How can they gain financially? You know, and that it's not just saving face, you know, for the company. So as long as we're good there, you know, and it's mutually beneficial, and that it's actually pouring back into the community, um, then we're, you know, we're in a good, we're usually in a good space. But there have been some people that want me to do all the work, <laughs> you know, whether it be, okay, you pick out the items and you coordinate with the designers and we're not gonna pay you and you did the job for our buyers. Oh, and do the campaign, you know what I mean? And like, it's like, okay, wait a minute, yeah. you know? So we've had to check a, a number of yeah. people like that. Um, and even recently I did a, a, a partnership, we did the campaign and I realized I was drowning at one point and I'm like, I'm up against two titans and we have to produce the entire campaign. Like, that's kind of crazy, you know? Mm -hmm. We did it though. That's the thing, and we killed it. That's <laughs> the best one yet, but, <laughs> but um, you, know, you know, so for me, it's always just the intention, you know, and that the intentions are genuine, and it's not, you know, a quick fix. Mm -hmm. I try to, you know, now it's really more about long-term partnerships, at least a year out or more, a few seasons, mm -hmm. um, you know, and just, again, as long as it, we're good, we're good, because it, at the end of the day, these are platforms. I mean, we were talking about the Netflix, Nike, these companies, I mean, we are, you know, we, if a brand is getting, you know, a couple thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is, it's, it, it's really changing their lives, you know? And I, and, I, and I hope I'm not like just repeating a bunch of stuff that was said earlier, but, um, you know, it's changing their lives. So it's, it may not be, you know, it's nominal to them, but as much as we, you know, you want to draw the line it's like it really can change the again the trajectory of their business and what they're reinvesting into and how they're able to scale and grow and you know so and and just from your end of things pat like how you work with young designers people at different parts at, at different ends of their career yeah. how do you kind of decide on who's a target for you and what what are you looking for you know if we take one person, you suddenly realize you're hitting a community. Because I wonder how many people benefit from what you do and what you do. So it's not just about the, the designer. It's about the economic or socioeconomic impact by supporting that designer. That can change many lives. So it may not be you know, massive, but the fact that you can get a supply chain that is not the traditional supply chain. It may be an auntie or somebody within your community that to say, listen, I have to deliver everything for this product. I need you to do boom, 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 and I'm gonna pay you, and I'm gonna pay you to do boom, boom, boom. All of a sudden, the community is benefiting. So what we've realized is that this is not just about the individual, that it actually impacts a community. and. I'm quite sure that in, in, in the diverse communities, one person supports a lot of people. I, can, I mean, I can attest to that. There was a designer, Sarah Dior, she does Tonguro. Um, I put her look, I think, on Beyonce maybe twice that year, and the photos weren't even that. I mean, it was like, like I'm, hey, I'm on a boat, you know? And then maybe, <laughs> you know, she wore once in South Africa. Sarah went from employing seven people to employing 50 people. 
that year from and some cheap Beyonce boat place. It's <laughs> simple. I mean, and it was like, it, but it's something as simple as like, and you don't know the reach, and that's why it's important to you know, okay, the the big grand designers of the world, fine, but to bring in and again, kind of blur those lines of luxury. I'm I'm always interested in like. Right. You know, okay, we have a Valentino thing, but then if I put, let me grab this thing for this little black girl. Let me right. see what you, what right. you're gonna know the difference. <laughs> right. You know, right. and and it makes such a tremendous difference mm -hmm. um, in in the business and and kind of funneling these things back to the independent business. We we all, we all think of mom and pop shops as, you know, those kind of tried and true, long standing, thirty plus years, but it is just independent owned business. Mm -hmm you know, and putting it kind of the money back in the hands of the people. Um, and just, oh, did you wanna? Yeah, just, to, just really quickly. I think, uh, so from my perspective of assessing collaborations, I think there's a few things. Yeah. One is where, what is kind of the vision of my brand and what adjacencies am I trying to establish? You know, uh, that's like a really tactical point, like who will I be sitting next to as a brand? Because I think, mm -hmm. uh, part of the like longevity that I want this business to have is I think going to be furnished by like really strategic and tactical thinking in the moment, you know? Mm. The other thing is the terms, you know? <laughs> because I think that from the other side of uh, being the designer who's being approached by X brand, you are like, okay, so is this a PR state? What, what budget? I just, is this coming out of? Is this coming out of <laughs> short term, like six month PR marketing, like scratch money? Or is this coming out of like, we are actually establishing a new initiative. Here's like how we see it going to play out for at least maybe for you and the other people around, you know, your peers in this program, maybe for far into the future. But like, I try to assess that, you know, because I think that's really important and then the last thing I just have to be like very real as like an independent artist, like um, you do have a brand, but it is about like, um, does this feel like it's like adequately va like valuing, valuing what I'm bringing to the table, right? Mm -hmm. So like, uh, I think back to what you said about like, now I'm doing the campaign and I'm doing this and I'm doing that and like uh, this and this was, uh, like the stipulations of those things is really important to understanding like how does someone value what you're bringing to the table? Is it that they just expect you to show up and like be beautiful and create beauty because that's just what you do, you know? Mm -hmm. And who knows where you live or how you can pay rent on that, but you know, yeah, yeah, like, right. uh, but you're so beautiful, you know? <laughs> or is it like, you know, hey, this is a market rate for someone who is in like a similar position as you, whether or not they've been like through the exact um, uh, trajectory to get to this point, right. like right. we're still being considered, you know, to do a collaboration that's gonna result in these things for your brand, which is yeah. an international major, you know, whatever brand, right? Yeah. And so the, the terms are very important, you know? Yeah. I think that we really do assert kind of our value in those terms, which is like so uncomfortable for me, but mm -hmm. it also is like feels like increasingly important yeah. as I progress. I think it's very different also for designers specifically, like, you know, because so much of your brand is tied up into it. And I think what these companies would try to give sometimes is so little, whether it's like a collaboration space or we're gonna give you, you design two things, we'll give you this flat rate. It's like, but you could sell and sell and sell, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I mean, especially I mean, we're talking about optics and how some of these, you know, potential collaborators, you're, you can be wary of why, what's behind it. So even if that's the case, how do you flip it and make it something that is right for you? And when do you just walk away? It's a, that's a really good question. And I think it's also an opportunity. I think that our consumers now are really into where is it coming from. The provenance has become so important. Um, you know this, that they want to know um, who's making it, uh, what impact is it having. And as De Beers, we, we now focus on it as a major focus for us to our consumers. And I think that that's going to be the trend going forward. 
you know, the questions are going to be, you know, what impact are you making, Jamil? We're putting you on, like you said, but who, who are you with? So to, to your point, it's, it's you're actually acting, they're acting as the enabler, and you're acting as almost like the source of opportunity to mm -hmm. demonstrate that. Um, how do you convert that into um, dollars and cents is all about coming up with a, a, a platform of marketing where it's coming from. Who are you? Who are you impacting? And what is the, the ethos of what you're doing as well? Yeah. Well, let's talk about consumers because um, obviously in the last year there's been a lot of spotlight on you know, black and brown creators especially. Um, but I've also heard from those same creators that it's been tough to ramp up, to, to meet, up. to keep up with the demand, to meet those needs. So what do you have to say to those consumers or how would you like to educate that part of the equation? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, right, I feel like uh, this is like just to be like absolutely real, like, I feel like my life really changed, you know, in 2020 with this like kind of resurgence of interest in kind of black politics and aesthetics. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was great, right? Like I, in, in one way it demonstrated that I was like really doing work that was maybe even a little bit ahead of the time, you know? And still, you know, I feel like the way that folks approach me now is like, so. So your problems are solved. <laughs> like, uh, like you're doing so well on Instagram. <laughs> like, uh, like uh, it's it's clearly sewn up, you know. And what I would, I think that like it's it's interesting, right? Because the incentives of the industry, I think, are to present an image of, and the incentives of our time are to present an image yeah. that is like, no, it's going great. It's going so well. Everything's perfect, you know. Um, but. I think that that can allow there to be like um, a parity in the minds of consumers between like yeah. this brand is on Amazon and it can get to me in two days right. and this brand it was also featured in that same article yeah. so I'm sure they can get to me in two days you know and so there is there is like a, an actual disparity right in like the infrastructural ability <laughs> of like black folks to like mobilize even against this surge of yeah. demand, which it should be said is not, you know, just a rightward arrow of like increasing interest, right? Mm -hmm. It's also like kind of rocky on that demand front, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so like marrying those two business challenges and doing that in the context of like appearing fabulous, you know, <laughs> is, is like very tough to navigate. And so I would, hope that consumers in this moment of increased interest in supporting black brands, they're also interest, interested in like understanding the realities of black people, you know, who are behind the black brands, you know, like uh, it's not black brands brought to you by Amazon, Amazon. you know, <laughs> it's bl exactly. black brands brought to you by black people at their black yeah. homes, you know, in their probably red line neighborhoods, you know, uh, like, uh, so, but there's, <laughs> you know, right. there's, there's a lot of structural history that cannot be righted by like feel your feelings of encouragement yeah. and like Absolutely. glee. It, or an order of one item, you know yeah. what I mean? Like it, it doesn't well, change anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know, uh, we need to I take mean, a moment. He said it, he said it, he said it, he said it, he said it. He said it. Backup is comedy. Drop the mic, Drop the mic to me. Important <laughs> death jewelry jam. You know, um, for the consumer to have patience. Jam. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. No, I was saying, I was just saying, I think it is important for the consumer to have patience, you know, overall. And, you know, and even start to consider pre-order as a, as a form of sustainability, okay? You know, like so. so true. I'll leave it there. I was with a designer yesterday who um, is well known and and is black, and literally sat down and just went, oh. And I said, you look pretty tired. And he goes, I'm dealing with supply chain in Milan. They're just like, this will be sent to you when we're ready. And he's going, I have a fall 
um, uh, fashion that needs to come out. And they're going, it'll come to you when it's ready. And to your point, those are the kind of challenges that um, smaller business and particularly black business go through because you're a new entrant into that space. And that's where the opportunity for incubation is to use the power of the relationship within the new establishment um, could come into play. I'm not saying there's a, like you said, there's no complete answer to it, but it's really a conversation of consulting to say, look, I do want to deliver, but I need the support as well. And, you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing because it's resources, like you said, but it's important that the success in this new establishment is for both. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not one way, it's for both. Yeah. Um, and just what are, I mean, you've kind of outlined that there are challenges that are specific to creators, black and brown creators. Are there other things like that you target or, or, or really want to kind of ameliorate what are, what's on your agenda? Um, everything. So we're actually writing programs currently to partner with people like Adobe on the tech side, um, Shopify on the e-commerce side, and training people, because like even right now we're onboarding brands and a lot of people don't even have like return policies and, and it's just very, some very, things that are very quite simple, you know, in easy fixes as well. Um, but these are the reasons why they, they're able to get chargebacks because it's not clearly outlined, you know, and things like that. Um, you know, so from technology, e-commerce, uh, you know, wholesale is a different beast, but you know, in that space, okay, product development, you know, you may just, again, the supply chain right now is a mess, um, but you know a lot of people. So then are having to turn and produce produce locally. You know, literally hire a tailor and do it that way. Or a lot of people, that's how they were producing their collection, uh, which is not very sustainable because then you have inconsistencies because this tailor doesn't sew like that tailor and things like that. Um, so just you know, from a product development standpoint, connecting them with you know different whether it's. India, China, in at Los Angeles, you know, in Florida, different uh, people to in the, um, to produce their garments, and then how is it how is it photographed? You know, how are you presenting it? You know, how are you utilizing social media? Mm -hmm. So we're working even with Google, like how are you even naming your product on the SEO to pop up in the Google search properly mm -hmm. when people search for items? You know, so it's just the, those tiny little things that can kind of get you into the alg algorithm, you know, a little better. Mm -hmm. and on a different note, also kind of consumer focused, since this is Jewelry Week, um, I, you know, you keep hearing, or you know, there's a, a, a feeling that Gen Z or the younger consumer doesn't appreciate fine jewelry the way older generations do, and I'm wondering, do you are you finding that? And um, I guess you know. A ring of, it can be the same price as a handbag, but one is probably going to be around a lot longer. So, how do you get that message across? Um, we have a demi fine jewelry collection and a fine jewelry collection, um, and both of them are, I think, uh, ostensibly marketed on those terms mm -hmm. of like jewelry is uh, an heirloom product, you know? And I do think that there are younger people who are interested in that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, whether or not they're always buying at the like most expensive price point in either of those categories, you know, uh, probably not yet. But there are, I think, definitely people who are trending into that market. And I would say that, like, in a way, like their kind of value system, I think, better aligns with with like uh, heirloom. The idea of something that's an heirloom, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. that's not disposable. That is kind of more implicitly sustainable in that way, you know? So I've, I definitely think that the young folks like a little jewel or two. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you. I have a 16-year-old, and she's into my vintage jewelry. She's like, she would love you. <laughs> <laughs> so she went from not touching anything to she's all in my jewelry and her grandmother's jewelry. And she's wearing it funky. I'm going, you do know that's a diamond ring, right? <laughs> so I agree with you. I think that there, there, there is definitely um, a generation that is looking for authenticity. 
um, and value that is hip. For them, the whole idea of vintage and old and new, the way you define it. Mm -hmm. She would just love you. <laughs> <laughs> and, I think, and I think, you know, I mean, and also it goes along with the trend, having all the necklaces that you can stack and keep on. When that stuff started to turn green, <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know what I mean? These kids are real gold. You they know? like they want to package differently, though. Yeah. You know, it has to be yeah. packaged differently. Give me a little pink, a little yeah. color, Interest. but they still want that stone to be done. <laughs> they they, they want to know what things are made out of. Yeah. You know, and I think like the clarity of that that mm -hmm. has always been tied to the fineness of fine jewelry. Yeah. You know, is like. Ooh, what is that sweater made out of? Like four percent mm -hmm. what? Like uh, you know. Right. Yeah. But the jewelry is like eighteen karat gold, girl. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, it just we've talked about some of the challenges, and I know that you're facing or have transcended. But also, I know you want to be, and we've talked, you know, earlier about a Harvard virtuous cycle, and so it's also not just about your getting ahead, but also thinking about the people behind you in the value chain. And that also goes to the consumer and they're concerned about where their products come from and what they're made of. So how are you adjusting that? I mean, it's hard as a, someone who's coming up to, to think about those things, but how do you address them? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, it is definitely hard. Um, there's a few things, right? So I would say that like part of my mission is to be there and I've, there was a previous question that I didn't answer, but I think that was about like, what would you like to impart um, to the next generation and to, 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 or to change? And I think that it's, it's really about spaces of education, you know, and getting like really subtle knowledges that I think that we're often excluded from mm -hmm. based on just interpersonal relationships and experiences. And so this summer we had like a class of interns, you know, and we made like all kinds of ornate, like ready to wear looks and all kinds of other stuff. But it was really gratifying to me to be able to like give a first internship experience in fashion to someone like not that much younger than me, but that like they could work at a company that has always been thinking about like their image, you know, and not like, can I sell party dresses into this like pre-existing empire? You know, <laughs> it's like, let's think about black issues together. So that's one thing um, is like internally. And then the other piece that is about the supply chain, um, that is a lot tougher, right? Um, and I think that I'm becoming more educated over time, partially through the partnership with De Beers um, about the origins and the differing kind of origin stories of different materials in different places, right? Because it's like uh, you, theoretically would like to source something in Africa, but does that mean that it's actually benefiting black people in Africa? <laughs> like, uh, does that yes. mean? Yes. Yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, you know. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. Yes, you know. <laughs> but that's like, those are things that are like kind of unclear, you know, as a person, you know, I didn't come into this industry with like a wealth of knowledge about what the best practices were or how to achieve them, you know, and I did come in with like a lot of kind of anxiety and judgment about my inability to kind of perfectly hit that yeah. on the first try. And I think that like what I have gotten over time is like start with one collaboration, start with like one like sourcing mission, start with like one capsule collection and grow, you know, learn over time and grow and you can have impact through iteration you know it doesn't have to just be like okay we had everything we needed to like perfectly set up this perfect thing mm -hmm. on day one mm -hmm. right or that first product or whatever it's gonna just it's gonna hit like that you know mm -hmm. it takes it takes time mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. and what about the consumer who doesn't care about black people <laughs> and black things and like black owned everything or you know afrofuturism like do you how are you trying they can't you, really av avoid us because, <laughs> 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 because right. the product is so good you yeah. know what i mean and they're tired of seeing the same thing and they want something cool and new and it's cool and new and funky and they don't know that and that often even if they don't know that the that the person is black you know but that's why it's important for those designers to be included in those spaces. So when you go to Annette Porter, you're shopping, you were just, just looking for a beautiful pair of hoops. Yeah. You know, and these happen to be the best. So 
to, to, there you have it. to your point, Serena, <laughs> sometimes it's not important to say it's black, right. mm -hmm. but it's about the design that is so different. Um, Sally and I were talking about this a few days ago that what's been lost in the, um, the lack of inclusion is the creativity, Ugh. you know? It's been so left out that now you're seeing incredible, I mean, some of the work that you're seeing as a result of the inclusion. So it's not so much about being black per se, that is a trade conversation. And with the consumer, what's important is for a, for a business, can I sell it? Mm -hmm. Is there, like you were saying, is there a consumer there that would want it? And definitely it's there. So I think there's two conversations in terms of inclusion and the diversity is about business, mm -hmm. not just about, it. and that's why I like the word establishment versus quota, because it's about a partnership and the older um, organization or the established organization calling you because of your creativity so you can do what you can do best and they can support it. So sometimes, yes, then you wake up and you go, oh my God, it's a black person. That's great. That's great. But at the end of the day, it's about your incredible designs. And that's, I think, even in that space, it's been in the inclusion conversation, it's been interesting to watch, you know, shopping for clients and, you know, pulling for projects. And I'm like, why is it that that dress that's flattering on a curvy woman and a slim woman, that it's always sold out? Yes. But why haven't you, season after season, bought more extra large? You know, I just never, I never understand that. So even beyond the diversity mm -hmm. conversation, it's like, okay, but the size 12 is always gone. Mm -hmm. So who's not re responding mm -hmm. to the market at mm -hmm. this point? Mm -hmm. You know. Agreed. I think for me, um, part of I, it's hard, right, to think about how much of it is like this moment, right? Because I think that a lot of the, the like the the centers by which people become aware of products, you know, and the things that they might buy, regardless of whether or not, like, it's narrative that's driving the purchase or just, like, this product is so great, right? A lot of them, I think, are kind of simultaneously talking about black folks and black creativity, you know? And I also recognize that there's, like, for black creatives, like, an inherent kind of, like, uh, tenuousness mm -hmm. of that, right? right. That, mm -hmm. like, if customer acquisition starts at the New York Times and the New York Times decides to cover another story, how, where does your business lie? You know, <laughs> at the yeah. bottom of that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I definitely do see a lot of, of consumers who are, um, who are interested in just the product, right? Or who are, whose primary get was the product. But I think it often comes downstream of someone who was mm -hmm. more like mission oriented, whether or not it was their personal belief or yeah. just their understanding of like, what was the story they were trying to cover for that time, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I would, I would say that we definitely have both, you know? Yes. And I, the other thing that I would say, which will hopefully sound a little bit less like cynical, <laughs> is um, <laughs> that I hope that the product can be like the beacon in someone's life that like allows them to like, oh, I didn't actually know that this product was about that, but I was just Googling it because I really love this necklace and I, want, I wanted to know what it meant. Mm -hmm. And then I get to the website and it actually means this. It means like a whole new view, like vision of black people. <laughs> like, uh, okay, cool. You know, I hope that people are able to take, you know, incremental steps as well, you know? Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Well, I, I know we want to get to some questions, so I'm just gonna ask you one more question and then open it up to the audience, um, which is, you know, what do you want to people who are seeing you now to take away from this, this conversation that we're having? Like, what is it that you want people to understand about what you're doing and how they can help you advance what your projects, your, your missions? Um, Y'all looking at me? <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. I, Tell us, Serena. Well, firstly, you know, I think we're kind of up here giving advice on how this industry have, has moved in the last year. It's only been a year mm -hmm. like that, that, we, that we're even getting this much attention, really. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's been slowly but surely, you know, and to, to tell someone this is the way that you have to do something 
when we don't even know if this partnership interest and in all of this is going to be around two or three years from now. Mm. Um, you know, there's no, there's no right or wrong way. You know, do what you love. You have to do what you love and move in that direction and move in what feels good. Um, that's, I mean, that's my hope, at least with Black on Everything, is to, in this space, regardless of what, the hope is that we'll be around and be a resource for whomever, you know, when they're ready or when they're looking, when they're searching, we'll be there. When the trend is over, as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, what would I like people to take away? I think um, the most crucial lesson that I've learned in the past few years, to your point, actually, is that, like, you should do what you think is right, you know? And you should do it in a way that is, um, that is aware of, like, the market position that you are in, right? If that is, like, of interest to you at all, you know, advancing in that market, you should understand, like, these are the players, this is the shape of the board, here's this organization, that organization, this person in th this role, this, this and this, right? But just know that like that board might have to spin a little bit around you. Like the entire world might have to change around you for like that, all of that work that you were doing ahead of time to like immediately come to fruition, you know, in a way that like, can happen so quickly that it's like, oh. <laughs> uh, and so I would say like make your investments, you know, of time and interest in the things that you truly believe in, you know, and do it in a way that like tries to at least understand how it's being understood by the people around you and try to negotiate that the best you can. But, you know, the time can come even if it's not ob immediately obvious but you have to be prepared, you know, and yeah. it's doing that work, you know, in preparation, yeah. you know. And then you can, you can, you're inevitably going to not be prepared for some part of right. what comes, right. but then you just got to grow a little bit more, because you know? It's, it's also yeah. remembering that it's not only the, the small businesses, like there are big fashion companies that were not ready, that did not have e-com, you know, at the yeah. start of the pandemic right. and that had to kind of rush and figure it out, but they weren't paying attention again to, yeah. you know, being comfortable and doing the wholesale thing. And when everything is online, everything is digital, building your, you know, your own audience, um, mm -hmm. you know, and spending the time being consistent. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Consistency. Mm. I think just to add to what, both of you have said is to have this conversation because this is not just a conversation it's also consulting right it's 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 opening up some of the things that people don't think about so to have more organizations like you said um, to be able to have these conversations and I know this has been said many a time you probably heard it that it's it's a journey but that journey must deliver an increment every single step. And the question is, when we have these conversations, what are the next partnerships and what does that look like? So I, I hope that the industry will continue to listen. Um, and you know, I think it's really important to hear what's being said and see it as a, as a business opportunity for everyone impacting many communities. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, I mean, that's how I made my way through life, you know, is mentorship. I still have mentors. Um, you know, I've been wanting, I mean, I don't know if I mentioned it clearly earlier, but um, I've just launched a foundation, the Acres and Acres Foundation, where we're really looking to get in the, into the community for the younger people, bringing up and, get, and teaching them entrepreneurial um, uh, skills and things like that as well, and financial responsibility, as well as incubating the designers that kind of need that that infrastructure um so yeah for sure for sure and the, the short answer is yes that we have initiatives it, uh, i would need another half an hour to talk to you about it but we have different types of initiatives that may not necessarily be mentorship but are definitely focused on development and partnership and enabling yes and same here i'm yeah i'm definitely open and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. I could say not 
not that well, to be honest. <laughs> like, uh, really well. I, you know, I watch a lot of documentaries. I listen to podcasts and NPR basically all day, you know, and that it's just like the kind of sheer randomness and like the amount of depth that they'll go into to explaining like the whaling industry, you know, in whatever, you know, age. Like, I think that's like really helpful for my exploratory process. But beyond those things, I feel like like as an at this stage in my like entrepreneurial journey, I'm so like home office like uh, specific event afterward home <laughs> like uh, uh, rest you know every so often every so often <laughs> yeah, you know, every, you know. um, sometimes for me it's actually the exact opposite it's uh, ter like turning everything off and not looking at things and making it up like because like why. Well, who did the person that's referencing, who did they reference? Like, I'm tired of reference. I don't want to reference. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone wants to see a board, but I'm like, it's in my head. I made it. I can't find an image of the thing that I have in my mind. Just let me do it. You know, sometimes it's just kind of, for me, it's just doing whatever the thing and just making whatever that crazy idea it is in my head. Um, and then separately, uh, doing things outside of work, which is not even a thing, so whatever. I'm not even gonna sit here and lie like I be playing tennis and going on hikes. I be trying though, but you know. I do have a rose garden, and for me, sometimes it's just kind of stopping, putting the phone down, going for a walk, coming back, tending to my garden, my herbs, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, the roses. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I like, I'm more of a kind of a, I like, you know, for me, it's spirituality is also important in business um, and in life in general. So growing plants and things, you know, they can kind of grow as you grow, and, you know, I like the philosophy behind that. Um, for me, it's watching the brands that I work with um, and the creators, even if we've just posted them, you know, then now I'm seeing them in magazines. I see them on celebrities. I see them on covers of magazines and they got PR as they go into the showroom. They're present there. Um, it's just as simple as that. And just watching their business grow is the most rewarding. Well, I, I think I really loved seeing Christopher John Rogers Rent win um, American Women's Wear Designer of the Year. I feel like that was like incredible to see we're about the same age and like to see him, his trajectory and like the the finesse, the quality of that business. Like it's just mm -hmm. like, ugh, like <laughs> nothing ever looks slapped together. Yep. Nothing ever looks late. It just looks like, wow, like doing it. And I love to see people who are, who put in that amount of like serious work, like seriously rewarded for it. Excellent. Well, thank you all. This has been fantastic. And thanks for coming. Thank you.